Hey everybody, Rob Mauer here, and today we've got quite a few things to go through. We have news on Tesla's 4680 batteries. Sandy Monroe has acquired a 2021 Model 3, so we'll take a look at his first impressions. There's a new full self-driving beta version, some news on Tesla Energy, and a few other stories as well. Quick look at Tesla stock after the long weekend. Not a bad day for Tesla today, finishing up 2.2% to $844.50. That was in the backdrop of a strong macro environment. The Nasdaq today finished up 1.5%. We'll start here with a quick update, obviously this is widely expected, but Tesla has now officially started deliveries of the Made in China Model Y. This comes just over a year after the first deliveries of the Model 3 in Shanghai. This seems to be more than just a handful of vehicles. We had started to see newly produced Model Ys start to stockpile at Shanghai towards the end of Q4. Looks like Tesla has now delivered many of those. They had a synchronized delivery event in 10 different cities across China. All right, now let's move into batteries. We have, I guess, three different stories here on batteries, the first of which is a new video that Tesla has released over the weekend showing some behind the scenes of the 4680 battery cell manufacturing process. Tesla also included in this the link to their battery jobs page. Aside from the interesting footage, Tesla also overlaid this with a song, and if you go to about 19 seconds into the video, the lyrics mention a million miles. Now, it's pretty unlikely that this would be coincidental, especially considering the fact that this was mentioned over on Twitter by Dave Lee, and Elon Musk liked that tweet. This million mile battery concept is something that we talked quite a bit about leading into Battery Day, so I'll reference those older episodes, but the gist of those were that Tesla has already had the technology to have batteries that go a million miles. It's really just about balancing the trade-offs for that increased life cycle and what that costs you elsewhere in terms of actual cost per kilowatt hour or energy density, things like that. And that doesn't necessarily change with these new 4680 cells or with Tesla's new battery production methods. And I'm guessing that's probably why they didn't spend a ton of time talking about it at battery day. I think life cycle is incredibly important for a robo taxi. If you're not using your vehicle for robo taxi type purposes, you're only driving 10,000 miles a year, getting to a million mile battery is inconsequential. So depending on the product, Tesla may optimize for different things. Model 3 might be more geared toward life cycle, for example, versus the Roadster, that's gonna be much less important. Either way though, a million mile powertrain is something that Tesla has been working on developing for a long time. Last year in the impact report, they talked about how that can lower the total emissions profile for actual production of a vehicle, which is actually one of the criticisms of electric vehicles. But if an electric vehicle can go a million miles rather than 250,000 miles, then you're getting four times the utility from something that produces a similar amount of emissions, maybe you know, 10, 15% more emissions to produce a Model 3 than another premium sedan. So if you spread those emissions out over the utility of the vehicle, your per mile emissions from that manufacturing use phase decreases to just a fraction of what it would be for an internal combustion engine vehicle. I think the only other point here that I would add is that Tesla's move towards a structural battery makes life cycle that much more important as that significantly diminishes the possibilities of swapping in a new pack and sending the vehicle on its way. Speaking of the structural pack, Electrek has obtained what they believe to be the first photo of Tesla's actual 4680 structural pack. In terms of new information, I'm not sure there's a whole lot that we can glean from this photo, but it does seem to match what Tesla has posted on their battery jobs page in terms of their animation there that has this battery structure. They both look to be the same offset grid of 24 cells by 40 cells, so 960 in total of the 4680s, versus last count we had of the Model 3 pack, long range at least, was 4,416 2170 cells. Tesla at Battery Day said that the new 4680 cells had five times the energy of the 2170s, so if we have 960 of the 4680 cells, those should contain a similar amount of energy to about 4800 2170 cells. That would mean all else being equal, which of course Tesla talked about why all else is not equal a lot at Battery Day, but if all else were equal, that would mean about a 9% increase in the amount of kilowatt hours per pack. It is important to note though that Tesla only gave us one significant digit on that 5x energy number, so depending on whether that's closer to 4.5 or 5.5, that roughly 9% increase in energy could actually be as high as almost 20% or as low as actually being a loss in energy of down 2%. The slide that Tesla has that 5x energy on, they say plus 16% range, so I'm guessing closer to the former than the latter. For what it's worth, a 16% increase would mean the energy capacity, instead of being 5x, would be about 5.33x, while the volume of those 4680 cells is about 5.5x the volume of the 2170s. So I think 5.3 times the amount of energy, that would be less energy per volume, but would not represent nearly the decline in volumetric energy density that a simple 5.0x would. Long story short, if we go off that rumored 82 kilowatt hour pack size on the newer Model 3s, we add 16% onto that, that would mean a new Model 3 pack, just with this change alone, could be something like 95 kilowatt hours. It's going to be an exciting year this year, watching a lot of this come to fruition. 
Next here on batteries is the news that Tesla and Jeff Don's battery research group at Dalhousie University have extended their exclusive battery research contract through at least 2026. The group has also named two new research chairs, Dr. Chan Yin Yang and Dr. Michael Metzger, who are being groomed to eventually take over the operations at this laboratory from Dr. Don. Don, welcoming both new chairs, said that, quote, our goal is to continue to help Tesla develop better advanced batteries for its products. Dr. Yang and Dr. Metzger bring new ideas, new methods, and new expertise, as well as a full commitment to electric transportation and renewable energy to the partnership, end quote. In a video included in this announcement, Don also said, quote, I'm really thrilled that Michael and Chong Yin have joined us, and over the next five-year period, they'll take over the laboratory operations and continue the partnership with Tesla, so that's really very great, end quote. So Don will continue working with this battery research group, but he also did note in that video that, quote, after July of 2021, Tesla will allow me to interact with select Nova Scotia businesses, so I'm very happy about that because it will help us grow the economy here even more, end quote. Apparently, select Nova Scotia businesses includes Novonics because in July of 2021, Novonics has announced that Jeff Don will be taking on the role of chief scientific advisor at the company. Now, this is in addition to Don's work with Tesla, which it sounds like he will still be continuing. However, it does seem clear that there is sort of a succession plan now in place. From Don's comments, it does seem like age is a factor there. Don is 64. So if you want to hear all of Don's comments, I'll put the link to that video in the description, as well as links to the videos from Dr. Metzger and Dr. Yang. All right, moving on from batteries, Sandy Monroe over at Monroe and Associates, who at this point I think probably need no introduction, has received a 2021 Model 3. So they've started giving their early impressions on the build quality, some of the things they're seeing from a cost perspective, changes that they found from their last Model 3 and more recently even the Model Y. And they've really just started this process, so I'm sure many more videos to come, which we will keep an eye on for takeaways. That being said, so far, some mixed commentary from Monroe. His first impression was, unfortunately, on panel gaps. They had some areas of high variance on this Model 3, particularly on the passenger side doors. So at the top of the door, for example, they're seeing a gap of about one millimeter, and at the bottom of the door, about five millimeters, which is definitely visible looking at the vehicle. So Monroe was hoping for an improvement here. He was understandably disappointed to see these. Panel gaps is an area that receives a lot of negative attention for Tesla. We've talked at length about that on this channel in the past. To some extent, I think it's justified. There clearly is room for improvement, but on the other hand, we don't tend to see much statistical analysis of this. For example, comparing a broad sample size of Tesla vehicles to a broad sample size of BMW or Toyota or Honda vehicles. And aside from more glaring alignment issues, which I definitely don't think is happening on every single vehicle or anything like that, I don't think most customers tend to notice things like this. So I think it gets overemphasized, not to mention the fact that a lot of these things can be fixed by service afterwards. So would it be better if every single car were perfect? Of course, but there is a cost to perfection and Tesla has to balance that to some extent. If they could have every vehicle be perfect, but that caused production to be, you know, 10% or 20% lower, then it's probably not the right trade-off to make especially again because a lot of these things can be fixed after delivery, which yes, may cost more money, but that could be a good use of Tesla's capital if that allows them to expand production more rapidly. I do also think, based on my assessment of anecdotal reports only, which is not a great way to look at things, but if we have to look at them, I do also think that Tesla over time has made progress here and hopefully will continue to do that in the future. If people are interested, what I can also do is I can take a measuring tool out and we can check out the panel gaps on my Model 3 and we can see what they look like. I'll tell you right now, there definitely are some, but if we do that, I don't know, we're going to have to sneak out to a dealership or something and measure the gaps on other new cars for comparison. Aside from panel gaps, Monroe seemed to be quite happy with the build quality. He was super happy with the interior, actually very happy with the paint, which he has been critical of in the past. He said it definitely felt smooth to him and felt like they had made changes to the paint shop in Fremont. So those were kind of the initial impressions. They've now just got it up on a hoist, and he said everything is looking good from a build perspective. He's happy with the construction of the suspension. He also noticed that there was one area where Tesla used to have a fastening part, where on this new Model 3, they no longer included that. So he walked through an example of how that saves, you know, maybe 17 cents per Model 3, but across 400,000 vehicles, that ends up saving $68,000. And assuming the Model Y is the same, you can go ahead and double that. Sure, saving $135,000, not really a big deal to Tesla, but over time, those things can add up. Next up today, I just wanted to point out that Tesla has released yet another version of the full self-driving beta. This is being dubbed FSD Beta 10, although I think this might only actually be the ninth release, but it sounds like this is a pretty significant step forward from the previous version. The early reports from FSD Beta testers are that it's doing unprotected left turns much better, 
and there are now a few different circumstances where the beta was not working before, where it actually does function now. So without having that hands-on experience, I do think it's difficult for most of us not in the beta program to really understand this. We have to kind of rely on these anecdotes from each update, but what I think is clear is that Tesla is making progress and they're making progress at a very fast rate because we're seeing new versions of the software come out every week or two weeks. How much improvement there has been is probably up to the eye of the beholder, but it seems clear that there has been progress. I'm sure this is something Tesla will talk a lot more about on the Q4 call next week. Next here, we've got a couple pieces of news on Tesla Energy. I think the first one here was noticed by Electrek. Tesla has increased the price of the Powerwall by $500, now up to $7,500. I don't believe any other specs have changed here, probably just optimizing their pricing as they do from time to time. This is the second $500 increase that we've seen in the last six months or so. And it could just be a function of Tesla reevaluating things for both their energy and solar businesses with the introduction of the Tesla solar inverter. It's definitely seemed like Tesla has been production constrained on the power wall really since the product's introduction, so I think any price increase there makes sense. Electrek has also reported that there may be a new project here involving power walls. California based energy company Swell Energy has announced that they have received approval from the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission on a $25 million contract with Hawaiian Electric to create what they call a comprehensive virtual power plant on Oahu, Maui, and Hawaii Islands. Swell has used Tesla Powerwalls for similar projects in the past, so that's likely again the choice here, and they expect to have batteries in about 6,000 homes as a part of this virtual power plant. Always good to see projects like this, and I think especially valuable on islands where energy is generally much more expensive. Hawaii, for example, is the highest cost energy state, with electricity costing more than double the US average. We'll wrap things up today with some news from Rivian, SpaceX, and The Boring Company. Starting off with Rivian, we had previously talked about how they were raising capital. That has been now announced by Rivian to have been completed, with Rivian raising $2.65 billion. That brings their total funding to date to right around $8 billion, ahead of deliveries which they expect to start this summer. Separately, Bloomberg is reporting that the capital raise has valued Rivian at $27.6 billion. Next on SpaceX, just wanted to let people know there are quite a few interesting things happening this week in case you don't follow the company quite as closely. Likely the most exciting would be a potential test flight later this week, looks like it'll be not earlier than Thursday, of the serial number 9 SN9 Starship. This would be a similar test to what we recently saw for SN8, where we have the test launch, a multi-kilometer test flight, the belly flop maneuver, into landing. So we'll have to keep an eye on the schedule for that. We also have potentially two launches carrying Starlink and some other cargo this week, the first of which has been delayed but is now scheduled for tomorrow, Wednesday, January 20th at 8.02 a.m. Eastern Time. This first launch would be 60 Starlink satellites, and then later this week we could have 10 more. So far, there are 887 active Starlink satellites up in the constellation, so after this week that number could increase to 957 total. This is exciting because we had previously heard from Jonathan Hoffeller, SpaceX Vice President of Starlink and Commercial Sales, that for their first phase of deployment, SpaceX is targeting 1,440 Starlink satellites, which he said, quote, that's when we get 24-7 global coverage, and the plan is not to stop there. We'll continue to launch, and with each launch, we can provide more and more capacity. There's never enough capacity. You can't limit what your kids want to watch and what your family wants to consume, so we'll continue to densify the network, end quote. So in addition to these 70, it looks like there are 300 more Starlink satellites scheduled to be launched in Q1. That would put the total Starlink active satellites at the end of Q1 at about 1,250 and should put them on track to hit this 1,440 number sometime in the latter half of Q2. Now, of course, SpaceX has plans to continue launching thousands and thousands more Starlink satellites, but it seems like at least at that point, we would see a global expansion of the Starlink beta. From there, I think expansion to more and more customers would follow rapidly. Lastly, here is an update on The Boring Company. Of course, last week we talked about the tunneling system that they're working on in Vegas. Well, it turns out we weren't the only ones talking about tunnels last week. Elon Musk, according to his tweet in reply to Miami's mayor, discussed Boring Company tunnels with Florida's governor last week. Elon believes they would be a great solution for Miami, so he says, quote, if governor and mayor want this done, we will do it, end quote. Miami's mayor tweeted back, count me in, no brainer, we would love to be the prototype city, end quote. So something there to potentially keep an eye on. That will do it for today though. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday, January 20th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.